Straight ahead on this special edition of Focus, tips to help you prevent two of America's most deadly diseases, heart attacks and strokes. Together, they claim more than a half million lives every year, but you can take steps right now to lower at least some of your risk factors. Learn lessons from survivors and hear from local doctors, plus find out the superfoods you should add to your diet and the other ones you should cut out altogether. It's all coming up right now on Focus. Focus showcases the people, places, and issues that matter to you. Everybody has a story. These are the stories that uplift and inspire right here in your neighborhood. Focus on what matters. You never know what you're going to see when you tune into Focus. Support for Focus is provided by the people of Air Products feel privileged to bring this programming to you. By supporting education and the arts, Air Products strives to improve the quality of life here in the Lehigh Valley, where we call home. You're safe at home at Luther Crest, a Diacon senior living community in Allentown. Our mission is to offer premier accommodations and services so residents can cultivate a healthy and fulfilling retirement. At Luther Crest, we offer independent living apartments and cottages, personal care, skilled nursing, rehabilitative services, and more. Plus, the Luther Crest team strives to provide each person family-like support. You might say it's like a home run. Luther Crest. News doesn't stop. We cover it 24-7, 365, because that's what our readers demand from us. You need to know what's going on, who's playing by the rules, or who's breaking them, who's winning and who's losing. The full range of the human experience plays out every day in the pages of our newspaper and website. The platform you choose to engage with us is your business. Delivering the news is ours. Thanks for joining us. I'm Laura McHugh. As we focus on health, we focus on prevention. Each year, almost 800,000 Americans die from heart disease and stroke. While we can't control some risk factors, such as age and race, we can manage most major ones. We start with a story that should inspire all of us to stand up to heart disease, the story of a little guy with a lot of heart. Brittany Garzillo is here to tell us more. Brittany. Thanks, Laura. Did you know that 27% of infants who die of a birth defect have a heart defect? According to the American Heart Association, congenital cardiovascular defects are the most common cause of infant death resulting from birth defects. In this story, you'll meet one local boy whose battle with heart defects proves no match for his superhero strength. We'd like you to meet Sam Vlasics. Like most three-year-old boys, Sam Vlasics likes toys, tickles, and pretending he's a superhero. I look like Batman. You do look like Batman. But in the eyes of Sam's parents... He is a hero. If he didn't have surgery, there's, he would have lived a week, tops. Here at the hospital, the doctors helped your brother's heart. Doctors discovered Sam's kryptonite moments after he was born. He didn't detect femoral pulses, the pulses on the inside of his thighs. Born with not one but two life-threatening defects, yeah. Sam could have died within yeah. days, but they were no match for his fighting <laughs> spirit. So Sam was uh, diagnosed with uh, a critical heart uh, problem, which uh, is called uh, interruption of the aorta, number one, and uh, he also had an associated heart defect, which is called the aortopulmonary window. Dr. Ramesh Kedwari detected Sam's problem within a day of his birth. And I said, uh, I think there may, there may be a problem. Eventually, he ended up in the NICU. Um, they had taken blood pressures of his extremities and found that there was no blood pressure in the lower half of his body. The results could have been really bad, yes. Yeah. We could, we, we could have lost him too. Without surgery, his heart would stop beating. So at one week old and only six and a half pounds, Sam earned his first battle scars from open heart surgery. There isn't anything that could prepare you for the way they look after surgery. You feel helpless. You don't, you don't know what to do. Um, you know, you're, you're, you can't do anything to help your child. Sam went back to the OR at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children in Philadelphia for his second open heart surgery within a matter of months. But when they told us that he needed another one, it was just, it was just as devastating as the first one. Um, 
they had repaired his heart with his own tissue the first time. And for whatever reason, that just didn't take. It's not very uncommon for a baby with a complex heart disease to have a second heart surgery. It may not be within four months, but it can be um, down the road. According to the CDC, Sam is one of nearly 40,000 babies born each year with a congenital heart defect, making them the most common type of birth defect in the United States. Dr. Kidwari says heart defects in children can be caused by hereditary gene mutations, maternal abuse of alcohol and tobacco, and viral infections during pregnancy. Today, Sam is three years old and thriving. He continues to see doctors at St. Christopher's every six months and is a symbol of strength for the American Heart Association. Sam is this year's child chair and we would love to see you there. He's been getting checkups um, since then and it seems to be growing with him at this point, so we're, we're hopeful that it'll continue. And I think he will need a surgery down the road, but for now we're just taking it, you know, every six months. Nobody even knows anything happened to him unless they know us or they know our story or they see a scar. I mean, he plays soccer, goes to preschool. As for Sam's parents, they advocate for heart defect awareness any way they can. They're holding their annual Warm Hearts 5K run and walk in February and are in the process of creating the Sam Vlasics Foundation. They've even gone to the state capitol to lobby for a bill that would require all Pennsylvania newborns to have what's called a pulse oximetry screening, a simple non-invasive test that could save the life of a child with a congenital heart defect. What the pulse oximetry does is just... It's just an extra check before they leave the hospital to see if there's a heart defect. In the future, the Vlasics hope the bill will become law in the state of Pennsylvania so that more small but mighty children like Sam will have a fighting chance yeah. against heart disease. For Focus, I'm Brittany Garzilla reporting. Thanks, Brittany. Every year in February, the American Heart Association urges us to go red for women. The campaign raises awareness to the fact that heart disease is the number one killer of women in the United States, claiming more lives than all forms of cancer combined. Here now to share the numbers every woman watching should know, cardiologist Dr. Ann Manny of St. Luke's University Health Network. Dr. Manny, thanks for being with us again this year. Thanks for having me. You know, every February we spend this time uh, during American Heart Month to help raise awareness about heart disease, and you're here to tell us the numbers every woman watching should know. You said number one, their cholesterol. Right, that's one of the traditional risk factors that we look at. Uh, this can be checked relatively easily by checking up uh, your blood cholesterol. There are parts to your cholesterol. So the numbers that we look at specifically are your total cholesterol. And what we want to see there is that your total cholesterol should be less than 200. Um, your, there's something called the HDL cholesterol, which is your high density lipoprotein. That's your good cholesterol. And for women, we generally want that to be higher than 45. So we actually want that number to be high. Your bad cholesterol is your LDL cholesterol. That's what we really focus on. And we used to talk about there are age-related cutoffs for those numbers and also what your other risk factors are. If you have a history of coronary disease already or you have a history of diabetes, we want that LDL number to be less than 130 and ideally less than 100. If you have, if you're just, you know, a 55-year-old woman, no high blood pressure, no high cholesterol, that LDL number can be a little bit higher. Now, a lot of the uh, cardiology guidelines recently have moved away from focusing on that LDL number so much, but we still do use it in practice. And then the last part of the cholesterol is the triglycerides, which for women particularly can be a different, a gender different uh, risk for having uh, coronary artery disease. And the number we look for there is less than 150. You say the next number we should all know is our blood pressure. Correct. So blood pressure is another easy thing to check either in your doctor's office or in a pharmacy that has a, a blood pressure cuff for checking. And for most people, the goal right now is for your blood pressure to be less than 140 over 90. Um, that is if you are younger than 60 years old. If you're older than 60, it's actually getting a little more, more lenient. You can be less than 150 over 90. If you have diabetes or any kidney problems related to high blood pressure, then again, we want your blood pressure to be less than 140 over 90. Next, our body mass index, or what's commonly called our BMI. 
Yeah, and that's really easy. If you know what your height is and you know what your weight is, you can go on any computer and look at a body mass index calculator. Ideally, we want you to be less than 25 for your body mass index. 25 to 30 is considered overweight, and over 30 is considered obese. What's our next one? Uh, one of the other really important numbers is to get checked for your fasting glucose. That's a screen for diabetes. And your fasting glucose should be less than 100. If it's higher than that, you may be at risk for diabetes if it's between the 100 to 126. If it's higher than 126, then you may actually have diabetes. A lot of people don't realize that they have a risk for diabetes or that they actually have diabetes without getting this test done. And you said the final number we want to pay attention to is our waist circumference. Right. And this is an easy thing everybody can do at home if you have a tape measure. For women particularly, the waist circumference, we want it to be less than 35 inches. So now we know all of these numbers, and you were telling me that doctors like yourself are now taking these numbers and looking at other risk factors and determining somebody's long-term risk for having a, a heart attack or another cardiovascular event. Correct. Explain. So recently, you know, we, in the past, as cardiologists, we looked very, we were very focused on the cholesterol numbers based on your other risk factors. Um, the current guidelines that just recently came out uh, try to, to make us focus less on those LDL numbers and total cholesterol numbers and talk more about what your general risk is for having cardiovascular events in the next 10 years. And that's taking into account things like your age, your gender, whether you have high blood pressure, whether you smoke, whether you have high cholesterol, whether you have a family history of heart problems, using all of those risk factors to create what's called a 10-year risk calculator for your risk of having a cardiovascular event. And if your cardiovascular risk is more than 7.5% over the next 10 years, then we should be having a discussion about whether you should be on a cholesterol medicine. So who do we see and how often do we want to get these numbers checked? The fasting cholesterol should probably be checked uh, once a year as, as you get older. When, when you're younger, maybe in the 20s and to 40s, it may be done every three to five years. But as you get older than 40s to 50s, you probably want to get screened once a year. Should we be going to our family doctor or seeing a specialist like you? Your family doctor can do a lot of the screening, uh, but obviously if you or your family doctor feels more comfortable, we also do have a Women's Heart Center where we do screen for all of these things for women who are interested. Finally, Dr. Bain, before we leave, we want to make sure that we are sharing the warning signs of a heart attack or another cardiovascular event with our viewers. We know that we have warning signs for the general population and then signs that are very specific to women. Share with us first uh, what the general population should be aware of. So the classic signs for a heart attack are chest pain, sweating, having the chest pain that, or, or radiating to the left arm, having left arm numbness or weakness associated with shortness of breath. You may feel nauseous. These are all signs that you could be having a heart attack. Those are the classic signs. Um, women, interestingly, tend to not have those classic signs as much. And that is why we believe women tend to show up later to the emergency room with heart attacks because they don't, they don't realize they're having a heart attack. Women tend to have more atypical signs like fatigue or just feeling off from what they usually feel hmm. or having significant shortness of breath, not really understanding why. Uh, so even when they go to see their health care provider, the health care provider is not connecting that those signs and symptoms are related to a heart attack unless an EKG is done. So it's really important to get checked out, but also to make sure that your doctor is thinking about a heart attack. Dr. Manny, thank you so much for sharing this wonderful information with us. You've inspired me to go get my numbers checked the next time I go to my doctor. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. One theme you'll hear us repeat throughout this show is controllable versus uncontrollable risk factors. One we can control, our diet. Focus reporter Grover Silcox takes us to historic City Tavern in Philadelphia, where he's joined by Chef Walter Stabe, who will share some superfoods and recipes for healthy eating. Thanks, Laura. Chef Walter here is going to show us how to eat healthy and eat well all at the same time. Walter? Grover. Great to see you again. You know, it's been a long time. I know, know it has. We're not, we're not going to tell anybody for how many years we worked. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you something. You've, every time I see you, you outdo yourself. What do we have here? Well, Grover, you know that I cook in a taste of history. Right. 
where the food is kind of heavy and Lots of cream, lots of butter, lots of schmaltz. You have right. It. But for many years, I've been experimenting with heart healthy cuisine. The new show, which is called Superfoods, which have all the state concentrates on foods that are very good for you. The only thing you're missing on this set is what? Salt. You notice that. I don't use any salt because salt is not good for you. Right. So what I make up for is with lime juice and herbs and other seasonings. So the recipe I'm showing today is one of my favorite. And you asked me earlier, years ago, with my accent and quinoa, people say, what is he talking about? Yeah, what is quinoa? <laughs> so quinoa is oh. about 15 minutes that it takes for cooking time. And it's a salad, fantastic protein, because it's a grass, it's not a weed. And it grows in high altitude, in the, in the higher altitudes in South America, like uh, Peru, Bolivia. Right. And uh, matter of fact, uh, this is so fantastic. But, but uh, like I said, people did not realize uh, what it is. And now it's a craze because it's gluten-free, number one. Oh, so, gluten-free. Yeah. So what yes, I done is... a very I, popular thing now to, yeah. get, to eliminate gluten. So what I did is I grilled some vegetable grover very easy. You just can put them on your, on your barbecue grill at home in the summertime or a kitchen blade. And the grilling is for two reasons. When you grill a vegetable, you take the liquid out of the moisture. Right. Vegetables are usually 80% water. Mm -hmm. So by grilling it, you enhance the flavor of the product because you're taking the water out of it, see? Right. Now, is this an eggplant? This is an eggplant that's yeah. got grilled. So I'm chopping the eggplant down. You know, that looks good in and of itself. And eggplant is very good for you. Eggplant is unbelievable. I used to work, matter of fact, we talked about earlier when I was in Russia. Right. I was down near Sochi, where the Olympics is now, and I saw the people eating all that are called baklajan. And it's basically uh, eggplant. It's and now what do we have here? Now we have summer squash. Summer squash, okay. But let me tell you, there is no right or wrong. If you don't like one of the vegetables or other vegetables, you just don't have to even follow it. You, you can know. use what you like. Whatever you like. Can you find these in your supermarket around the corner? Let me tell you, I would say that you're almost convenience store easy. There's nothing esoteric in there. And this particular table today, maybe one, is the dragon fruit. We go to this in a moment, so I'll show you that. So I put a little bit of portobello in here. But like I said, you don't have to use portobello, for matter of fact. A little bit of onion, and then a little bit of uh, zucchini. All right, and again, whatever you like. Oh, no, those vegetables I have right now are pre-cooked, pre-grilled. What is not pre-grilled is the onion that we're going to chop right now. Okay. So we take a little bit of raw onion. Raw onion. And the reason you want this, you want the blanchment of the flavor. You could also put shallots in there if you like. Shallots are good too, but shallots are a little sweeter uh -huh. for okay. my taste, so like so. So basically what I have there, <laughs> I already chopped some tomatoes down, just a little, some plum tomatoes, I put it right in here. Okay. Tomatoes. Then I have what's very important, we talked about earlier, smell that. that. It's the tarragon. Mm. The herbs that makes the difference. So a good amount of fresh tarragon. And then you're going to put a little bit of chives in here. Okay. All right. Now, let me just clean this thing off here quick. Now I have my quinoa already portioned out. Okay. So I put the quinoa right on top. There we go. Like so. And this is your protein. This is Solid protein. protein. And matter okay. of fact, what you should do, you should dry a little bit of that and see how nice it tastes just by okay. itself like that. A little bit of pepper in there. Oh, you had the grandfather clock going off. Perfect. Time. Well, we are in mm. 1773. <laughs> wow. You know, John Adams must have eaten this because he lived in 90. Yeah. It's a little bit of uh, a quality, vine a quality vinegar. Let's put it over here. A quality okay. vinegar went in there. So you use quality vinegar. Uh-huh. Quality vinegar. A little bit of oil. Pepper already done in there. And mix it up. Okay. All we got to do now is show you quick this. Uh, okay, now what is this? Some kind of decoration? <laughs> it's a dragon <laughs> food. Look how beautiful it looks. A dragon food? Uh, it's, uh, food Can you get cactus. this at a supermarket or a corner? Uh, any specialty stores, like really? any of the okay. big, the Wegmans and stuff like this, all, all have it, not a problem. And this one you want to just cut it up like so, but it gives you unique, very unique flavor. Where does you know? the dragon fruit come it's from? It's from a cactus, and it gets harvested at night. Really? Mm -hmm. I, I have a, really I have I have a little bit of uh, a little bit of radicchio okay, here. Okay, have the presentation is all important. Yeah, with a little of the beautiful mixture in the middle, like so. And now we're going to take the most important thing that you were eyeing me before, which is a beautiful loin of ahi tuna. Okay. Want to do me the tuna? I'm just going to all right slice it up, making sure that it's good. Mmm. <laughs> that looks good, just the way you ate that. Doing but one. Okay. Two. Two. A little bit of microgreens on top. Your tools. 
Wow. Oh, and I use the chopsticks, huh? And here you are. Okay. Now, what do you think about that? Well, let me give this a... Whoop, I'm getting... Um, I have to get my coordination to get... Here you go. Mmm. You know, it's so good. It's hard to believe it's healthy, but it's both. My entire message for the show, Superfoods, is you can eat healthy and tasty and nice presentation. Nothing holds you back. Mm-hmm. Nothing's holding me back. Yep. Thank you, Walter. Walter Stabe, proprietor of the City Tavern, host of Superfoods and a Taste of History. You're, you're the man. Back to you. Thanks, Grover. We'll have more tips from Chef Stabe later in the show. But first, we hear from a true survivor. She's in the studio now with Brittany. Thanks, Laura. In the words of Mark Twain, Michelle Satunis was a sinking ship with nothing to throw overboard. She didn't smoke, she exercised, she ate the right foods, yet doctors still diagnosed her with heart disease. Michelle, when did you learn that you had heart issues? I always knew because I was born with a heart murmur. Um, it became more apparent as I got older. Now, did you have a family history of, of heart disease? I do, I do. Okay. So, like I was just saying, like many people, you didn't imagine yourself as the face of heart disease. You didn't. When you ate healthy, you didn't smoke, you led a very active lifestyle. Um, so when did you find out that you really had a critical heart problem? I, um, I became symptomatic at 21 and had an echocardiogram done, and I was told at that point that I had mitral valve prolapse. was never really told the, signic the significance of that, um, so I really didn't think much of it. But when I was 38 years old, I went in to see my OBGYN for my yearly visit, and um, he listened to my heart with a stethoscope and immediately became alarmed and started asking me questions like, how do you feel? Um, are you tired? And I said, yeah, I'm a little tired. He said, how tired? And I, and I said, you know, I'm just a little bit tired, oh, more tired than usual. And then he said, how's your breathing? And I said, it's funny that you should mention it. I'm kind of short of breath. And he said, how short of breath? Um, so immediately he arranged for me to see a cardiologist. And on that day I discovered that I would be having open heart surgery. How much later? Um, the next day, I, he, he actually arranged for me to see the uh, cardiologist. I had an, uh, another echocardiogram done, and it was revealed to me that um, I was much worse than I even knew. Um, three weeks later, I was having my first of three open heart surgeries. Wow. And then you say several months after that, you didn't feel like yourself after that surgery. I didn't. I did not feel well after that surgery for a really long time. Um, I kept going back to the doctors. And um, they kept saying that everything was fine and that my heart was fine and that the valve placement was fine, or the valve repair was fine. Um, and I just kept pressing and pressing. Uh, they kept telling me perhaps I had anxiety. Um, then my doctors began to prescribe anxiety medicines. But I was certain that it was something else. Um, my body was telling me that it was something else. My husband and I were transferred to Nashville, and I, after 11 months, I finally found a doctor there who did um, a simple transesophageal echo. Um, and discovered that the valve repair had, had failed miserably. So I was now on my way to my second open heart surgery. So you had to have your second open heart surgery. And then tell me about that, because this was an 11-year span before you eventually had your third open heart surgery. So yeah. tell me what was happening. In the second surgery, um, they decided that the repair had failed, and they would now replace the, the mitral valve with a pig valve. So I was given a pig valve in the mitral valve position. Um, I was better after that surgery but I wasn't great. I was better than the first surgery, but I still wasn't great. I would spend the next nearly 11 years of my life trying to convince doctors in the state of, of Tennessee and in the state of upstate New York um, and in the state of Pennsylvania um, that something wasn't quite right. Um, and I, I could not convince anyone. I ended up living my life pretty much like a, an 80-year-old woman. So. Tell me about some of these symptoms you experienced. I know you said your lips it, were blue. Yeah, I had. Um, I would get terrible arrhythmias. Um, if I was sitting here talking to you, I'd be fine. The minute my body got up and went into motion and did any sort of physical activity, my lips would turn blue. I'd become extremely short of breath. My fingers would turn blue. Um, I had trouble doing a flight of stairs, and I was only 39 years old. So that just didn't didn't make sense to me. So I kept pressing and pressing and again every doctor I saw in every state wherever I lived kept saying it was anxiety and that I should get psychiatric counseling and that I should take the anxiety medicines and that my heart was fine. Um, and that really wasn't the case. So you eventually you did find an answer and you found one here at Lehigh Valley Health Network. I did, I did, I sure did. I, um, I ended up um, Sadly, I ended up in the ER several times and, again, was sent home several times from the ER told it was anxiety. I, um, I ended up collapsing on the floor in my home and rushed back to the hospital where it was discovered that I was in class 4 heart failure. 
um, I'm told that it's one of the worst heart failures you can be in. So um, by the grace of God, I, I had the most wonderful heart surgeon I could have ever hoped for. It was Dr. Raymond Singer at Lehigh Valley Cedar Crest Hospital. He's the chief cardiothoracic surgeon. Um, I wasn't very nice to Dr. Singer, and I'm so sorry for that when he first came in, because I expected him to be like everybody else, and he certainly was not. Um, I remember being so fearful that I would not survive because I had never been so sick in my life. And I remember him saying to me, you know, just to trust him and to trust his team there and that they would take good care of me, and they sure did. How successful was that, not for just, obviously, your physical health, but for your mental health? Oh, my gosh. It was incredible. It changed my entire life. Um, Dr. Singer ended up putting a mechanical heart valve in the mitral valve position. Um, he also discovered while he was in there operating on me that there was an issue with my tricuspid valve, which we did not know. So he ended up repairing that. And the, the years that led up to this third surgery, um, I had something called atrial fib, which is a dangerous heart arrhythmia that can put you at a high risk for blood clots and stroke. So he did a maze procedure for that. Um, and I, uh, I am so much better than I have been in a really, really long time really long time. That is just absolutely amazing to hear, Michelle. And we're so happy you're so much better. So now, what do you do to pay it forward? Um, I volunteer now with the very people who saved my life, which has been such a blessing for me. I always tell everybody that I got so much more than my heart fixed medically by Dr. Singer and his team. I got my heart healed emotionally because I was very angry when it, when it was revealed to me all the things that, that were missed um, during that 11-year span. And I found so much comfort and love and peace in those people. So I volunteer a couple days a week there at, in the op open heart unit and in the transitional open heart unit. I also am a volunteer with our local chapter of the American Heart Association, and I do a lot of, of, of good things with them, and I'm blessed to be able to do that too. We have our heart ball coming up on February the 22nd. Um, it's my second heart ball volunteering with them, so I'm excited about that. And I do a lot of other volunteering. I have a little boy that lives across the street who has autism, so I try to raise a lot of money and awareness for that. Um, my son-in-law and a family friend are also military people, so I do a lot with sending packages to soldiers um, that are deployed in Afghanistan. That's fantastic. Now, I know when we were talking earlier, you said you hope that your story, and the reason you share your story, is to save someone else's life. What's the single most important thing you want people to know out there that may be in the same position or maybe fall through the cracks? Yeah, that... yeah, and there's a lot of people like that because, ironically, since my heart surgery, I've been, um, I, Dr. Singer and I did a Sunday morning radio show. I've been on, on, on their Healthy You magazine, and people just kind of know me through the story. And they say, let me, tell, let me tell you my story. And I'm like, sit down, yes, I want to hear your story. But then five minutes into the story, I hear that their story is nothing like mine. They didn't get the happy ending that I did. They lost somebody they loved. Um, one of the things that always stuck in my head and still does to this day is I remember watching the Dr. Oz show, and he said that our bodies send us signals all the time. We just don't listen to them. I would want people to listen to those signals that your body sends you because my body was screaming something was wrong and the, I think the one thing that saved my life is that I never gave up. I kept persisting with my doctors. The other thing is I never thought I was the face of heart disease and so many people, like everybody thinks it's the overweight guy who ate too much fattening foods and smoked a carton of cigarettes and never exercised and it's often them but it's often me. It's young girls like you. It's Nobody thinks of heart disease and the words young. They always think old person with, with a plethora of, of health conditions or health diseases. And it's, it's not always that. So pay attention to, the, to, your, to your symptoms and act on them. And if, if a doctor is telling you that it's nothing and your gut's telling you that it is, go with your gut. Go with your heart because it's what saved my life in the end. You have to be informed. You have to be your own advocate and you have to be persistent. Michelle, thank you so much for sharing your story, and we wish you the best of luck thank in the you. future. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Back to you, Laura. Thank you, Brittany. We switch gears now from heart attacks to brain attacks. You suffer a stroke when something blocks blood flow to the brain. If the brain goes without oxygen for 30 seconds, unconsciousness follows. In four minutes, you can suffer irreparable damage. So if you have symptoms of stroke, physicians advise you to seek immediate medical attention. That's what Victor Shako did, and that's probably why he survived his stroke and is on the road to recovery. Here's Focus reporter Grover Silcox with more. Victor Shako, a scrappy 59-year-old former trucker, used to run three and a half miles every morning before loading and unloading 18-wheelers. But last October, Victor was stopped in his tracks when he woke up paralyzed by his stroke. This whole left side was gone. It was, I couldn't use it. I couldn't pick up this arm. I couldn't pick up my leg. What's most important is if you have symptoms, 
get yourself examined and get yourself through an emergency room. Victor survived his stroke and improved his chances for recovery by getting to the emergency room within 30 minutes of discovering his condition. They said, Vic, you're, you're, you're in the process right now of having this stroke. One of Victor's arteries was blocked. Any event that causes um, change in the blood flow to the brain may cause stroke-like symptoms or stroke symptoms or a stroke. It can take only four minutes of decreased blood flow to cause permanent brain damage. Symptoms include weakness, um, weakness of the face, weakness of an arm or a leg, or both, uh, usually one side of the body more than another, um, speech disorder, weakness, numbness or tingling, headache, vision problems, loss of vision or double vision may all be part of strokes. The medical team at St. Luke's Anderson campus went to work assessing Victor's symptoms. The whole workup of a stroke patient involves deciding what the most likely cause of the stroke was. What we want to do is reduce the risk of an event occurring again. Greater than 30 percent of patients may have another event in one month to a year after an initial stroke. Doctors perform a variety of tests when a patient presents stroke symptoms. They range from visual observation to the latest imaging techniques. Generally in the emergency room you're going to get a, a CAT scan of the brain to look for evidence that maybe you've had a stroke before, uh, maybe uh, there's other changes, maybe there's bleeding and not necessarily lack of blood flow. You can get the same symptoms from bleeding in the brain as well. In Victor's case, a piece of plaque came off an artery wall and blocked blood flow to the brain. This caused a full-blown stroke, as opposed to a TIA or transient ischemic attack in which stroke-like symptoms go away within 24 hours. The problem with TIA is if you ignore it, it will often lead to a stroke a week later, a day later, a few hours later. So it shouldn't really be ignored. Victor spent a month in St. Luke's Hospital, which included rehabilitation. He left in a wheelchair. But on this day, two months later, he returned to the Anderson campus using only a cane for balance. Now, occupational and physical therapists work with him as an outpatient for two hours twice a week. They'll be working my hand. You'll see a lot of things with, with uh, working with my wrist and ro working with motion, okay? A lot of small things. They're honing my skills with my fingertips and my touch right now. That's what we're working. Then physical therapy, he'll have me working on balance. I, I can't stand up on just my left leg. My balance is pretty bad on my left leg. But we're getting there. All right, Victor, what number are you up to here? The earlier the, in, the interventions in, in rehabilitation, the more intense the, the interventions in, in, the, in the early stages can lead to improvement. Doctors now know that through therapy, other neurons can be recruited to perform the lost functions. But they're going to help me uh, get back to where I want to be, which is walking uh, by myself without the use of the cane. Dr. Connie sees Victor's motivation as key to his continued recovery. And I'm no ordinary Joe here. You know, uh, I'm not a quitter. I'm not a quitter. So when you get knocked off your feet, get up, get up and get moving. So we're moving. That was Victor's motto as a truck driver for 35 years. And that's his motto now as a man determined to reach his destination. For Focus, I'm Grover Zilcox reporting. Thank you, Grover. To help us learn more, Dr. Hussam Yacoub joins me now. Dr. Yacoub is a neurologist with Lehigh Valley Health Network. Welcome to Focus. Thank you. Dr. Yacoub, what are the warning signs everyone at home should know when we're talking about stroke? W warning signs of stroke uh, usually occur suddenly. The patient would experience sudden onset of the stroke symptoms. Uh, symptoms would include um, slurred speech or what uh, patients describe as garbled speech, difficulty getting words out, um, one-sided of the body, a heaviness, clumsiness as some people describe it, or uh, weakness and numbness. Uh, that can include the face and the arm or it can include the face, arm and the leg as well. There are other um, stroke uh, signs and symptoms such as visual changes and um, difficulty with language. Why is it so important if you notice any of those symptoms to call 911 or get a medical attention immediately? Um, it is important since, as you said, there are treatments uh, for stroke now, including um, clot busters, like we can describe, and um, uh, brain damage can be irreversible. So it is important to get to the hospital as soon as possible uh, to receive the appropriate treatment and management. 
What are the latest uh, and greatest treatments available in our region? Um, at this time, the only FDA-approved drug for uh, uh, melting a clot is called TPA, or tissue plasminogen activator, which is given by the vein. Um, the patient has to present to the hospital within three hours of onset of symptoms. Um, beyond that, we do have further uh, treatment options, including going up the brain with a catheter and suctioning out a clot via a variety of methods and using different tools. What is that time window? I know you said it has to be within three hours uh, for the TPA. Is there a time window um, where it's just too late? The, ti the time window for IV TPA is three hours. There are certain criteria that um, can include a patient for treatment of IV TPA for f uh, after four and a half hours of symptoms onset. Um, the, the rest of the timing spectrum varies from case to case. For interventional procedures, the time window can be up to 24 hours, actually, in certain blood clots in the back of the head. Otherwise, we, we encourage within six hours of symptoms onset. What are the risk factors for somebody having a stroke? We've been talking about those risk factors for heart disease. I'm sure that some of them overlap. There are um, several overlaps. There are two categories that uh, I, tr I uh, like to classify the uh, risk factors in. Uh, one category is controllable risk factors and the other non-controllable risk factors. The um, controllable risk factors uh, include high blood pressure, hypertension, diabetes, uh, cholesterol, triglycerides, and tobacco abuse, smoking. Um, the non-modifiable risk factors or the risk factors that we can't control include age, genetic factors, and having already a history of stroke. So what are the age genetic and genetic factors that we should be aware of? Well, you can, I mean, the risk of uh, stroke increase with age. People can have uh, genetic mutations and genetic disorders or diseases that predispose them to having stroke more than the general population. Are they things we can find out and learn about? Um, yes, but we don't routinely screen for those disorders unless warranted. For example, stroke in the young patient, we do screen for those genetic mutations and disorders. We talked um, earlier in the show about TIAs, or what are commonly called mini-strokes. Uh, many of these go undiagnosed, is that correct? Um, TIA is a transient ischemic attack. The T stands for transient, meaning short-term. I ischemia, like you said, lack of blood flow to the brain by with whatever mechanism. And A is attack. Uh, these are what is known in public as mini-strokes. Uh, they do last a few minutes, up to 60 minutes. After 60 minutes, most likely we will see stroke on the, on the brain imaging. Um, it is tricky to, to label an event as TIA as there are a lot of overlaps with complex migraines, um, seizures, and so on and so forth. Should people be lo looking for those symptoms because they could lead to a, a major stroke event in the future? Correct. Having a transient ischemic attack along with other risk factors for a stroke does increase the risk of having a stroke in the next few days or so. Uh, patients who recognize symptoms of stroke that last only a few minutes should come to an emergency room immediately for further evaluation. So and even if they're feeling better? Perfectly normal. And I always do recommend, we always do recommend the patients to be admitted to the hospital for further workup, looking for the source of the TIA because it's a warning sign for stroke. What are the long-term effects of stroke? Disability. It is a major cause of disability in the United States and around the world, and uh, a major cause of death, fourth, number, fourth most common cause of death in the United States. So if viewers are watching tonight, what's the number one thing you want them to walk away knowing and understanding about stroke? recognize early symptoms of stroke and call 911 immediately. And again, those warning signs, we can't let people know enough. Sudden onset, slurred or garbled speech, right facial or left facial droop, right body or left body, what, what I call focal, uh, symptoms of clumsiness, heaviness, uh, weakness, even total paralysis. And before we wrap up, who's noticing these symptoms? Are we noticing them in ourselves or are we noticing them perhaps in a parent in a loved one? Both. A patient can still be able to recognize and appreciate the stroke symptoms of weakness and clumsiness or slurred speech. 
people run to a mirror immediately and look and find their face twisted. Uh, many times family members do recognize other symptoms as well. Thank you so much for this very valuable information. Vascular neurologist Dr. Hussam Yakub, thank, thank you very you much for being here. Thank you. While recovering from a stroke can take weeks, months, or even years, some patients make full recoveries, but stroke leaves others with lifelong disabilities. Brittany's back with more. Brittany? Thanks, Laura. Strokes wreak havoc on the body and the mind. They leave victims with memory loss and trouble thinking, but they can also cause paralysis in parts of the body. In this next story, I'll introduce you to one local stroke victim whose world was turned upside down and now, because of breakthrough technology, is managing to get back on her feet. Michelle Bliven used to hike mountains. Now she tackles a whole new feat, learning to walk again. Good job, Michelle. It was in November of 2011 that Michelle's active lifestyle turned upside down. She suffered a catastrophic stroke that affected nearly every inch of her body. It was um, pretty devastating. With most stroke victims, time is of the essence. Michelle called 911 immediately, but the damage had been done. The stroke left only 30% of Michelle's brain to operate correctly. She has trouble maneuvering both sides of her body and vocalizing her thoughts. It was a, a very extreme rare stroke, like a bomb going off. And in the 80s, they said there are 33 documented cases worldwide. And of the one to two people per million that suffer from this, they don't survive this type of stroke. Michelle beat those odds, but spent about two years confined to her wheelchair, wondering if she'd ever walk again. Today, Michelle's just starting to take baby steps in the right direction. Just relax, Michelle. Relax your muscles. Twice a week, Michelle and her daughter Stephanie travel to Good Shepherd Rehab in Allentown, where she uses a device called Exobionics Exoskeleton with variable assist. This wearable bionic suit uses battery-powered motors to drive Michelle's legs and replace her neuromuscular function, allowing Michelle to stand up and walk for the first time since her stroke. So the Exo Exoskeleton is like braces with motors and a backpack. And it allows us to help people stand and walk again and also retrain them. Because with the device, there's parameters that you can set so that you can help someone learn how to walk more normally again or how to challenge them as they improve. So this is the EXO and this is the machine that Michelle is going to be using today. We already have her measurements that we've taken previously, so we're going to adjust the EXO to fit her upper leg, her lower leg, and then her hip width. Watching this machine robotically get her from a seated position upright was just phenomenal. It gives me hope. That's what it does. And one more step, Michelle. This particular model of the exoskeleton is mainly used to treat victims of stroke and spinal cord injuries. According to Good Shepherd, they are the world's largest user of the exo exoskeleton and the very first in North America to have the upgraded version. We were the first people to get the variable assist, which is the upgrade to the exo exoskeleton. Um, and prior to that, you didn't have as much flexibility and be able to really tailor the device to the patient's um, problems. And we couldn't really use it with someone who had a stroke. So the variable assist now allows us to work on one side of the body and, again, break it down so if someone has some movement in that leg, they can use it. Since starting with the EXO in September of 2013, Michelle's made significant progress. She is one of our more difficult patients that we see, so we had to do a lot of modifications and changes just to fit her needs. Um, but now she's taking, you know, f over 400, 500 steps a session. We've had people with less urinary tract infections, less respiratory infections. It helps your digestive system. So that in itself, to me, it's, it's worth it. This exosuit cost $130,000 and was funded completely by donations. But the healthcare professionals at Good Shepherd Rehab in Allentown say the look on the patient's face after they put on the exo is priceless. They need to know that all hope is not lost, that there is still value in their existence no matter what condition they're in. Um, there are so many tradi you know, traditional ways of, of rehabilitation, but you have to think outside the box. The path back is not easy, but um, this EXO machine is like something so 
wonderful. While Michelle may never climb mountains again, she's taken more steps forward from her stroke than she once thought possible. For Focus, I'm Brittany Garzilla reporting. Thanks, Brittany. Earlier in the show, we learned about the foods we should eat. Now we're about to learn about the ones we should avoid. I'm joined by Allison Unger, a registered dietitian with Easton Hospital, and Allison's here to talk about salt. So why is sodium bad for us in the first place? Well, Laura, one in three people will develop high blood pressure in their life. Sodium causes our body to retain fluid, which can cause our, body, our heart to work harder, which causes high blood pressure, heart disease, or even stroke. So how much are we supposed to eat every day? So the American Heart Association recommends about 1,500 milligrams of sodium a day. Most Americans are consuming double, if not more, that per day. I probably fall into that most category, and I even try to watch my sodium intake. So you told me that there's three main ways that we get sodium into our diet. What's the first? The first way is in cooking. Did you know that just a half a teaspoon of, of salt has 1,200 milligrams of sodium? That's almost it's nothing. That's almost an entire day's worth of um, sodium intake that is recommended. So if you can try to just you know, cook without any salt, try to use lemon juice, garlic, herbs to add flavor without adding any sodium or adding any salt. What's the next way that we get a lot of extra sodium in our diet? The next way is at the table side, You know, if you're using that mm -hmm. salt shaker. Um, sometimes people will, will add salt without even tasting a food, and that can add a lot of sodium on top of what's already in the food. So if you can try to take a step back, you know, make a challenge for this month of February, take a step back and taste a food before even adding any salt to it. And then if you do add salt, try to cut back slowly so that in time you're able to um, have your taste preferences change and maybe you might find that you enjoy the food without adding, adding any salt. And that taste change actually gets right into that third way that we get a lot of extra salt into our, into our diet. Yes. Which is? Which is processed foods. And I'm actually going to put you to the test today, and I have a number of food items that I want you to tell me which okay. of the two is higher in sodium. Okay, thanks, Allison. What are we starting with? So we have um, an ounce of potato chips, uh, which is about 15, 16 uh, potato chips, versus a can of soup. And this could be any kind of tomato soup. It doesn't have to be this particular um, type, but it would be a can of tomato soup. Which one, of, which one of those do you think is higher in sodium? Well, I, when I think of potato chips, I think of salt, and when I think of tomato soup, I think of vegetables. So I would go with the salty potato chips snack. So many people do think that, but the potato chips actually has about 120 to 180 milligrams of sodium, whereas this soup has 645 milligrams of sodium. It's so not even close. It's not even close. So the potato chips, not saying that I want you to go out and get potato chips, but it's less sodium than a can of soup would be. Wow, that's fascinating. And the next one are ingredients that we might commonly use uh, to make a sandwich. Yes, yeah, so we have two slices of rye bread versus two slices of low-fat Swiss cheese. Which one of those do you think is higher in sodium? Well, I think cheese tastes a little saltier than bread, so I would guess the cheese. So the rye bread actually is more is higher in sodium. It has two slices has 500 milligrams of sodium. Now every brand is a little bit different. Some brands might have less sodium, some might have more, but um, this particular um, rye bread is 500 milligrams of sodium in two slices. So the cheese is only 140 milligrams. So when you add in the cold cuts, you're actually talking about a pretty salty sandwich. Definitely. So and uh, once you add the cold cuts, the cheese, it adds more sodium. Instead, maybe you can cut back on how much of the cold cuts that you're having and add like tomatoes or lettuce to it so that um, you can cut back on the sodium intake. Okay, so I understood how these go together. Our next one isn't like the greatest uh, head to comparison, but I was still surprised. Which one of those do you think is higher in sodium? What do we have? Two waffles, Two waffles. versus um, some gravy. I guess the gravy because I think, you know, what I'm learning is that when we see something in a can, maybe that's mm -hmm. a sign. So many people don't realize that these frozen waffles can have a lot more sodium in them. Um, they're actually higher in sodium than this quarter of a cup of the gravy. Wow. The frozen waffles have 420 <laughs> milligrams of sodium in two waffles, whereas the gravy has 310 milligrams of sodium. So I thought I was going to score much better on this quiz than I am. So let's see if I can redeem myself with this last one. What do we have? So we have two tablespoons of uh, Italian dressing versus a half a cup of marinara sauce. I would go with the marinara sauce. So you are right. <laughs> we have the best Finally, for last. Finally, got one right. Um, the half a cup of marinara sauce is 540 milligrams of sodium, whereas the two tablespoons of the salad dressing are 440. 
So not to say that the salad dressing is great, but it's still lower in sodium than, um, it's, it's still high in sodium, so you still have to be careful with how much that you're having. So according to the American Heart Association, a good rule is to avoid the salty six, yes. right? Yes. So that salty six includes bread and rolls, pizza, poultry, cold cuts and cured meats, soups, and sandwiches. And if we do those six things, we can all, you know, go a little bit further into reducing our, yes. our salt intake by keeping an eye on those six. Keeping an eye on those six and um, just reading your food labels for the sodium content. Remember, 1,500 milligrams of sodium a day. Allison Unger, thank you so much for joining us thank today. Thank you for having me. Well, now that we know how to reduce our sodium intake, let's find out how to take those superfoods and turn them into delicious meals. Grover has more with Chef Walter Stabe. Thanks, Laura. Back here with Walter Stabe, Chef. Uh, what was that you made the last time? I can't even pronounce it. It was so good, though. Like quinoa, ratatouille quinoa, salad. Ratatouille salad. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Made a little dragon food and oh. then seared ahi tuna on top. Wow. I didn't think anything could top it, to be uh, honest with you. I watched how much you ate, so I know you <laughs> liked it. <laughs> so what do we have here? What are you going to make here? This next recipe takes it over the top. That's really? why I decided to make it for you. Oh. What I have here in the bowl, I have a little brown sugar. Okay. I have a little coriander. All right. Just uh, a little brown sugar? Yeah, a little brown sugar, yeah. Like yeah okay. A little bit. Just a little bit. Just and, for taste. Well, the reason you need a brown sugar it's like to cut, cut the acidity because you're going to see in a moment because the pomegranate seed have acid itself right and it will what cuts it so basically what I did I put a little bit of vinegar in there and the reason I do this early to let it dissolve you want to make sure that the sugar and the coriander on the ground is dissolved just like that okay so again no salt there's no such thing as salt that no. is the new salt is lime juice right? yes sir anyway so now what I do I already have the avocado cut so I put the avocado right in there. And avocado is a little tricky sometimes, as you well know. This one's here I picked up in the store this morning. So look how easy. You cut them the way I like to do mine, easy for the people. Just cut them open in four, take the seed out, mm -hmm. and just chop it down like that. And the avocado is good for you? <sighs> avocado very good. is very good for you. Avocado is spectacular. And then I have a little garlic here. Put some garlic in here. Got to go ahead and chop it. This is just an avocado pomegranate seed, kind of like a relish, like a salsa. Uh -huh. That's what it is for. The important part of it is, obviously you know pomegranates. They are in season right now. You see them in the stores. They're just beautiful. One piece of advice is be careful when you cut it open, when you see the thing out. Because what, what happens is, with the, with the, the seeds, this is very, very staining. It has it's on you really? forever. Mm -hmm. yeah, now, well. many stores, you can buy now the pomegranate seed already Already he seeded, just seeded. like that. Okay. Like I did here. So anybody seeds in oh, there? That also adds some beautiful color to that. No kidding. <laughs> That's why Molly likes it so much. This is her, one of her favorite you're things. Your assistant. Uh, like assistant, uh, assistant producer of the show, working hard on getting the recipes. We want to get the people so excited about this stuff that they have never seen it before. Got it? So I mix it up right now. Wow. That looks good enough to eat right, right Well, it's pretty right, good. Like that. The only other thing is now the heat factor is something that you can control. We talked okay. about earlier. Right. Smell those. Those are habaneros. Mm -hmm. Now, the habanero is, likes itself in there. You like it hot? Uh, Not too hot? Yeah, sort of medium. All right, good. Yeah, I do like a little, little edge. Okay. Now, the next thing we got to do is we, again, I need some red onion in there. And the onion, I recommend you always chop last moment to uh -huh. keep the flavor into it. Now, if you make a whole batch of this for right. like an extra day, don't put the onion in until you serve okay, it. Okay, you know? got it. So the onion, you just uh, chop it up quickly. That's all you need. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you want to reach me the pepper mill over there? Sure. Wow. On behalf of all of us, I'd like you to... <laughs> <laughs> it looks like an well, award of... Well, I like five different peppercorns. That's why it's a mix. Uh -huh. I make it myself. Is that right? I have pink, I have so white, I have black. No salt. This is the new salt. This is the new salt. The lime juice. <laughs> but lime juice, I would squeeze it up there like that. But okay. really, if you do it yourself, just a little bit, squeeze it in there, and you got mm -hmm. it. And now... Okay, a little bit of little lime. Bit, just, we got lime and lime. Now... Are you ready to plate it up, this gorgeous dish? And basically what I do for that, I want to give it a good amount of greens on the bottom. Uh -huh. I have a little frisee here. Okay. Frisee right. is just a nice lettuce that you get everywhere. Lasts up very well. Frisee, and I have some bib. So I take the bib lettuce on the bottom. Okay, a little bib lettuce. Mm -hmm. okay. Bib lettuce on the bottom, That's like good. so. Mm -hmm. And a frisee on top. Okay. And then I have the salmon already cooked. And the salmon is a beautiful centerpiece of salmon, like you see right there. I lay my salmon on top. 
And now I take a spoon and well, top you know, this. this is so good, they're actually sending an emergency crew up here to get a taste. Wow, that looks delicious, if I can say that. It's uh, the idea, Doc. It almost looks like a holiday salad. Well, it's kind of right. This is what, it's beautiful. It's simple. And the whole idea with the superfoods is don't overwork in it. Get your fork. Okay. And stick it in there. All and right. you're going you're gonna to see how gorgeous that is Okay. to eat. All right. Here we go. Oh, I probably should use the fork. It might be better. <laughs> All right. Take a little bit, put a little salsa on it. Okay. Avocado. Mmm. All right. Mmm. I know the reporter's always supposed to go, mmm. Who's the regardless. man? Regardless. Who's the but man this now? Who's is the, good. Who's the man now? <laughs> you are the man. Eating <laughs> but, healthy and eating well. That's the name of the but, game for but, Chef Walter's But, but let me tell you, you have no idea how excited I am for this new series that we're going to start taping right around the corner. Because if you eat like that, it's mm -hmm. beautiful for the eye, it's good for the body, it's good for your mind, it's good for everything. Heart healthy foods, superfoods, that's where the future is. It's the last word about superfoods from Super Chef Walter Stave. Back to you guys. And we're very excited to announce that Chef Stave will cook up avocados, apples, and all the rest on a TV show coming later this year. So keep your eye out for superfoods with Chef Walter Stave right here on PBS 39. And Grover, he is always such a delight to have on the show. Well, Laura, I could, eat, I could have eaten every one of those superfoods, which I probably is not the best way to go. But, uh, you know, eat some of them, but not all of them. In a fact, little every day, right? Yeah, a little every day. But this show has made me so hungry. I could actually go for a chip right now. <laughs> oh, no, no. no. Like, okay, I won't do it. See, this is why you need your friends. You need your support group. That's what you guys are. Although we did learn that that's a better choice than uh, tomato soup when it comes to sodium, at least. Incredible. There were a lot of surprises with that. Yeah, I failed that quiz oh, miserably. I, I would have. Yes, me too. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it just goes to show you that I watch my sodium intake, and I still did badly. So, you know, you just have to be aware of it well, all the time. Well, that's why we're time. here. To provide that information to make <laughs> and sure to share, you know. And to share some remarkable stories. Yes, I right. mean, how Absolutely. about Sam Vlasics? It's just I unbelievable. Know. And then Michelle gave me chills hearing everything through she went through. It's truly a miracle that both of them are here with us today. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so we've all got our pins. We just got them from the American Heart Association. And you'll be seeing us sporting our, you know, Go Red for Women pins. It's a little red dress throughout the next few weeks. Well, I don't know if I'll be sporting it, but. Maybe not the actual I'll get it to my wife. Just the pin. Just the pin. Just the pin. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so we thank you so much for joining us, and we always love to hear from you. Why don't you get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, or on our website, WLVT.org. We'll see you next week. And until then, remember to focus on what matters. Good night. Support for Focus is provided by... The people of Air Products feel privileged to bring this programming to you. By supporting education and the arts, Air Products strives to improve the quality of life here in the Lehigh Valley, where we call home. This special is brought to you by Capital Blue Cross. The freedom to choose. It's our most fundamental American value. And now you have the freedom to choose. A card accepted by over 90% of doctors and specialists. Go online to choose which plan is right for you and discover if you're one of the many who qualify for financial assistance. 